Hmm. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. I believe the title of this video will be Ambassadors for Christ? Really? Uh, this video is a result of a conversation that I had with um, Brother Bill Cuthbert uh, in England. We were talking on Skype earlier today. And as we were having this conversation, I, I felt that uh, this is a topic, a subject that must be dealt with. Now, I'm not someone that likes to just make videos every day just for the fun of making videos. I, I try to make a video if I feel compelled to do it. And in this case, I think that uh, this is something that uh, must be said. And I, I, I hope that uh, uh, people will receive this, receive this in the right uh, spirit. So, first let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses uh, 19 and 20. It says, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their tras trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Well, this he's committed unto us the word reconciliation. Uh, another way of saying that that I've heard very commonly used is that we are ministers of reconciliation. A minister is a servant. And as a Christian, a person who puts their faith completely on Christ for their salvation, and gets born again as a new creature, as a child of God, we immediately begin our ministry, our service for Christ. Some people are diligent about their ministry. Some people neglect their ministries. But we're all called to be servants. And the, the number one calling that we all have is this ministry of reconciliation. Telling the people the good news that Jesus paid for our sins. We're reconciled with God. And now we just need to put our faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ. And in that way, he will give us eternal life as a free gift. So... That's what we're all called to do as Christians. Uh, uh, and Paul uses the term, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now, everybody probably has their own answer here. If I ask you, what is an ambassador? But let's just look at the dictionary and see if we can get an understanding of what that word actually means. Uh, it says, a diplomatic official of the highest rank appointed and accredited as representative in residence by one government or sovereign to another, usually for a specific length of time. This is, to me, full of important information for us to understand about what being an ambassador means. It says, a diplomatic official. Diplomatic. That comes, that comes from the word diplomat or diplomacy. Diplomacy means that we are dealing with things in a diplomatic manner. A diplomatic official. We have a, an official capacity as a diplomat. And it says of the highest rank. So we need to understand this is a big responsibility that we have. This is a big job we've got. The highest rank, and it says appointed 
appointed. We are appointed by God to be ambassadors, to have this diplomatic position. As a representative, we are representing Jesus Christ and the gospel for a specific length of time. That's right. From the time you put your faith in Jesus and you're born again until your last breath, that's your ministry. And all that time, you're an ambassador. We're all ambassadors. <laughs> but how well are we doing this job of being a diplomat for Jesus Christ? Another definition says, ambassador extraordinary, a diplomatic minister of the highest rank. Isn't that interesting? Uh, these are just definitions from the dictionary, and yet it, it seems so theological. All of these choices of words. Am, ambassador extraordinary, a diplomatic minister. Yes, you are a minister. If, if you put your faith in Jesus, you're a minister. You're an ambassador. You're a diplomat. But how diplomatic are you? How, how, how much are you ministering? It says, of the highest rank. Of the highest rank. We've been given a big job as ambassadors for Christ of the highest rank sent <laughs> sent that's what an apostle is an apostle is someone who's sent we are sent on it says a special mission I mean this def, these definitions could have been taken out of a you know a bible dictionary instead of just a regular dictionary but we can learn a lot from this. So um, that's what we're all called to do as Christians. There are some people, though, that um, they don't want to participate at all. And uh, it's almost like uh, they're happy that they're saved, and but they will just withdraw and they don't want to participate as a minister, as a diplomat, or as an ambassador. They kind of withdraw like a, a monk withdrawing into a monastery. But we're not called to withdraw and go into seclusion. Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 15. We begin with that. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Everything we do is for the glory of God. But the point here is Jesus says, you're the light of the world. Don't hide your light underneath the uh, a bushel. Don't cover it up. People need to be able to see the light. Put it on top of the table so it lights up the room and people can see the light. So that means that we cannot uh, go into seclusion. Uh, we can't withdraw from the world. We can't become like a, a monk in a monastery. We need to be in the world where our light can shine. Now, let's look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. In, uh, just verse 15, I guess. It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 
So we we need to be in the world so our light can shine. And it says that we should always be ready to give an answer to defend our faith. That's going to require some study on our part too, some effort to learn so that we have these answers. Well, not only do we have to have an answer and be able to give that answer, but it says with meekness and fear. Meekness. Other translations use the words with courtesy, with humility, with respect. And that goes right along with being an ambassador. And an ambassador is diplomatic. And we're called to be diplomatic and have meekness and fear, which is courtesy, humility, and respect. This is how we should be interacting with the world. And let's look at Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. You see, when we're, when we're in the world, uh, not everybody that we're shining this light on wants that light. Many people want to stay in darkness and uh, they flee from the light or they fight against it. So when the conflicts arise, how are we to deal with this? We're supposed to deal with, with it with meekness and fear, courtesy, humility, respect. And it says with soft answers, because a soft answer turns away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. So if someone is hostile to the gospel, hostile to Jesus Christ, then, or if they are an atheist and even more so anti-theist, some people can be very horrible and dealing with them is not easy. But it says, grievous words stir up anger. So we're supposed to answer them with a soft answer. Now let's look at Romans 12, 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. So if someone declares themselves an enemy against you as an ambassador for Christ, an enemy against Christ himself, uh, we're supposed to respond to them unlike the world responds with soft answers and it says if if he's hungry you feed him if he's thirsty you give him something to drink you show kindness you you um, return hatred with love and it says, in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Now, that's a saying. What, what do you think that means to put coals of fire on his head? I believe what it's referring to is shame. Uh, and I've, I've seen this many times in my life. I've had people on YouTube, um, attack me. I've had people while I'm street preaching attack me and and then eventually they're apologizing because I did not attack them back because I returned with, a, with a, their anger with a soft answer and people have actually said to me I, I, I'm, I'm ashamed of the way I treated you and that's the burning coals on their head. It's shame because 
we as Christians do not respond in the same way that they've treated us. I've seen this many times. You know, in all my time street preaching, I've seen many encounters that were hostile. And I've, I know that I've observed a street preacher dialoguing with an individual. And the, the individual is being hateful. And, and that person may not be persuaded. But there are also, in the streets, when you're preaching, you have an audience. There's a hundred people, or two hundred, three hundred people around, all watching this engagement. And even though it may not be possible to persuade this one hateful person, how we deal with them is being observed by everyone else. So, we always have to keep in mind that we are representing Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, I've seen many times where the preacher lowers himself to the same level as the, the hateful anti-theist or, or the, the Jesus hater, the Jesus mocker. The preacher lowers himself to that level. I've even seen preachers getting in fights, fist fights with these people. I've heard them, I've seen preachers cuss and use profanity back at them and stoop to that level. And then I've seen other preachers be smitten and turn the other cheek. And if we follow the instruction, the uh, instructions that were given by Jesus and, and in the scriptures, they feel ashamed. And I've seen it happen over and over again. Now, I'm talking about the street preaching scenario, but the same thing applies to you too. People are observing us. When you have a, a Christian interacting with an unbeliever and the Christian stoops to the same level as the unbeliever in terms of their anger and their, uh, their, their, their the, the language they use, they're, they're acting the same way. The world looks at that and says, wow, that Christian, that so-called Christian is just the same as the other person, that hateful person. I've actually heard people say, if that's what a Christian is, I don't ever want to be one. So, now I want to look at Matthew eleven fifteen. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. When we are dialoguing with people, either directly or on the internet. We have to understand that some people are going like this. They're talking. They are not listening. All they want to do is lecture and, and uh, call you names and insult you or argue a point endlessly and they don't even listen. They have the ears covered up. Jesus talked about these people. Do you have ears to hear? Can we as Christians use some discernment? And we, as soon as we realize that someone is not listening to us, what are we supposed to do if we determine that they just won't listen? I, I don't see any example in the scriptures where Jesus continued arguing on and on with, with somebody. He made his case, they either accepted it or they didn't, and then he moved on to talk to someone else. So I think that's important for us. We, we have to learn to identify the ones who have ears. When they have ears to hear, that's who we spend our time with. If they don't have ears to hear, 
Well, what does it say? Let's look at Matthew ten fourteen. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. I think it speaks for itself. Once we realize that they won't listen, to shake off the dust, dust as a sign, okay, I've given up on you. I'm moving on to someone else. And Jesus says in Matthew 7, 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So Jesus is, again, telling us how to deal with these people who will not listen. The pearls represent the good news of salvation, the gospel. This, when we tell people the good news about the free gift of salvation, and they don't want to hear it, and all they want to do is be abrasive and hostile, we should recognize they don't have ears to hear and in Jesus' own words, we could identify that's swine. Don't cast your pearls this way. Let's dust up our feet and find someone who will actually wants to listen. Now, we are supposed to be a uh, shiner light in the world. But at the same time, we have to learn that there are some cases where we have to dust up our feet. And move on. And we we are supposed to separate ourselves from some people. Let's look at Second Corinthians chapter six, verses sixteen through eighteen. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. So, this is taking it a step further. This is disassociating ourselves. Sometimes, we have to just realize, let's use our spiritual discernment, and when we realize that someone doesn't have ears to hear, and we identify them as swine, let's just separate ourselves from them. Because we're commanded here, come out from among them and be separate. Yeah. Another example of this, we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? What communion hath light with darkness? I think I could take the word communion in and put in the word fellowship here in this case. How could we have fellowship with unbelievers? Now, I know people. I've got friends, family, they're unbelievers. Uh, I can have friendship, I can have a relationship with them. I cannot have communion or fellowship with them because fellowship and, and communion, these are, are spiritual words. This is a spiritual relationship that can only happen among, uh, among believers. So, uh, fellowship you know, you, you can only have fellowship with among believers and we should not be yoked together with unbelievers in terms of fellowship and communion. Now, some people right now, you might be saying, Luke, you're, 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 what you're saying seems so divisive. Well, you're right, it is. Let's look at Luke 12.51. Jesus said, Suppose ye that I am come to get peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. Jesus said he did not come to bring peace, 
where everybody's going to be unified and everybody gets along and we have ecumenicalism and, and just uh, everybody just accepts each other and we have communion among believers and unbelievers and everybody's having fellowship. He said, no, I didn't come to bring peace, but rather division. He goes on to say that everybody's going to be against each other. Fathers will be against their sons over Jesus. Mothers against daughters, father-in-laws against son-in-laws, over Jesus. They will be dividing over Jesus. The name Jesus divides. And Jesus said he came to bring division. What will you do with Jesus Christ? Will you embrace him as your savior? Will you reject him and say, I don't want to have anything to do with him. I don't believe any of that. That's the dividing line, Jesus Christ. Now, this brings me to the subject of Google Hangouts. I've been conducting my own Google Hangouts now for about a year and a half. Um, and I do it at least once or twice a week. The Hangouts are about two hours long each. And I, I don't join a lot of other people's hangouts. I'm not entirely against it. I'll join them sometimes. But what I find out is in your typical hangout on YouTube, you have uh, a violation of everything I've just said. You have unbelievers and, and believers uh, coming together and thinking that you're going to have some kind of fellowship and communion and, and have a discussion, and it turns out to be an ugly, chaotic mess. And so everything I've just said is that, okay, we shine our light. Do they have ears to hear? We're ready with an answer. But when we identify them as swine, we need to separate from them. We do not continue on, and we do not stoop to their level. If they get angry, if they get hateful, if, if they get vulgar, we don't resort to that. Because we're ambassadors for Christ. We're representing Jesus Christ, and the world is observing us. It's not the one individual that we, we, we may be arguing with. It's all the people who are watching us, who are saying, the Christian is just like the the, the hater. If that's what a Christian is, I don't want to be one. And that's what I'm seeing in a lot of the hangouts. That's why I don't participate in a lot of those hangouts. What, what I've done in my hangouts so that I don't have that issue is that uh, I, I don't have an open invitation for just everybody to join the hangout. The people who are on my hangouts uh, have to have certain qualifications. We, we, we are there for fellowship, for communion, for Bible study, for teaching. And you can only have that if people, uh, have certain characteristic qualities, uh, uh, qualifications. And in my case, I require that someone agree to certain tenets. Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Salvation is a free gift. You receive it through faith alone in Christ alone. No religious work is ever required of you for your salvation. And once you've received the gift of salvation, it is eternal life. You can never lose it for any reason. These are the core doctrines I expect people to agree with if I'm going to have fellowship with them. Then I have a fourth requirement. It's not a doctrine of theology. It's just a rule so that we don't uh, stoop to the level that I've been describing. And that is that we must be nice to each other. Be polite and courteous and be tolerant of other people's opinions on minor doctrines. We don't fight over minor doctrines. We fight strongly. We're dogmatic for these core doctrines of Christianity. But the minor doctrines, we talk 
it out with love and respect and courtesy and we learn from each other. That's the way I conduct a hangout. That's the way I believe it should be done. Now, I understand that not everybody's like me. I, I, it's not fair for me to impose my rules and my method of operation on you or everybody else. There's more than one way to do hangouts. There's more than one way to interact and relate to people. So I certainly can't impose my personality on you and say you have to speak the way I do and act the way I do. I might not be doing it the best way at all, but these are these are things that I found are necessary so that we have a uh, constructive conversation and discussion. Uh, and it's also the way I feel that the scriptures are instructing us to conduct ourselves. Finally, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, we've used this verse a lot to show that uh, legalism does not apply to Christianity. Uh, there, there is no law. We, we can do whatever we want. But when we do things that the scriptures speak against, like losing our tempers and getting angry or fornicating or, or lying or anything, there's all kinds of instructions in the scriptures telling us the right way to live our lives versus the wrong way. And when we violate that, uh, there, there are consequences. We don't go to hell because we violate them, but there still are consequences for bad behavior in life. And so relating it to this idea of how to be an ambassador for Christ, how to conduct a hangout, how to relate to believers and unbelievers. Um, yeah, we're free to, to uh, interact however, however we want to. But is it expedient? Another word for that would be, is it profitable? Is it beneficial? I don't think it is. I've watched a lot of hangouts, and I say there's nothing beneficial about that. And nothing good's coming out of it. It's all that's happening is destructive. And the observers are saying, doesn't seem very Christian. They say, I'm not a Christian, but I look at that and I say, that doesn't seem to be Christian, as I understand what Christianity is supposed to be. All right. Um, I would say that um, I hope that this is received in the way that I've intended it. Um, I'm not your pastor. I'm not above you in any way. I'm simply your brother in Christ if you're a believer. I have no authority over you, uh, but I do think that this is something that uh, I want you to consider. So, thank you for watching. And if you have never put your faith in Jesus, this is the perfect time to do it. Uh, being a Christian is, is, does not mean that you have joined a religion or you become a religious person or you follow some set of religious rules. Being a Christian means that you put your faith in Christ. Most people in the world have faith in something else. They put their faith in the Virgin Mary or the Pope or Muhammad or they put their faith in themselves 
most people. That's the biggest mistake in the world. All the religions of the world are based upon putting your faith in yourself. That means you believe that if you can perform at a high enough level, God will accept you and let you go to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we don't get to heaven because of our own righteousness. None of us can be good enough to go to heaven. That's why we all need a Savior. That's why God became a man in Jesus Christ. Because he realized that we're all failing. No one, no one would be in heaven unless he did something about it. it says he, he loved us so much, he came down from heaven. He became a man. He died on a cross. He paid for all of our sins. Now sin is no longer an issue between man and God. Sin was a barrier between man and God. They couldn't, we couldn't have a relationship because of sin. But Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. The barriers removed. Now you're free to come to Jesus and embrace him. Scripture says that we love him because he first loved us. How much did he love us? Jesus said there's no greater love than giving your life for a friend. And that's what he did. They didn't take his life. He willingly laid down his life for you because he loves you. So put your faith in Jesus Christ instead of yourself. And you know what? I can prove that he is God Almighty. And he does have the power to give you eternal life. Because he raised himself from the dead. <laughs> he said he would give us a sign. To When the Jews asked him for a sign, he said, the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. He predicted he would raise himself from the dead as a sign to prove he is God, to prove that he paid for our sins. And because of that resurrection, you are justified in putting your faith in him. He promises you eternal life. God doesn't lie. He keeps his promise. Put your faith in Jesus now. If you do that, please let me know. For everyone who is a believer, you're a child of God, you're my brother or sister in Christ, uh, bless you all. And I pray that we can all learn to just rest in the arms of Jesus. Rest in this love and grace of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ. Good night.